We're going to be taking a little bit of a different track from uh, the many ministers and heads of state that we've been hearing from so far. When people like to talk about U.S. foreign policy, they like to talk about it in terms of either the White House or different agencies or the Pentagon or the State Department. Very few talk about the role that the U.S. Senate plays in foreign policy making. But this is the branch of the U.S. government that is tasked both with ratifying treaties and then also officially declaring war. So therefore, the Senate has a very powerful role to play in the formation and in some cases the execution of U.S. foreign policy, which is why I think we are incredibly lucky to have two very respected senators with us today, both on the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. Over on my left is Senator Dick Durbin, who has a, a lifetime of experience serving the country as a whole, serving the Senate. Uh, I'm not going to gush too much over their resumes because we need to get to questions later, but Senator Durbin has a very distinguished career in the Senate, and he is a giant when it comes to talking about foreign policy. And then between the two of us is Senator Jean Shaheen, who has a distinguished career both serving her home state of New Hampshire and then uh, more recently in the U.S. Senate. And she's been making quite a splash as well, writing about NATO and, and the future of America's place in the transatlantic alliance. So without any further ado, Senator Durbin, would you like to open us up with some remarks? Okay. Should I sit, stand? Sure, we can sit. Sit. Why not? Thanks. <laughs> it's good to be with you. And I uh, want to acknowledge my friend Marshall Bhutan in the uh, front row here. <clears throat> We've worked on many foreign policy issues together. I wish I could have a few minutes to talk to the people who are walking around with the signs about my vision of NATO, what it has been, and what it can be. It's a little different than some of their signs portray it. In fact, it's a lot different. Most of us remember the creation of NATO as an effort to stop the expansion of totalitarian regimes into the European theater. It occurred right after World War II, when many of these countries were still reeling from the losses, uh, both physical and mental losses, that they'd suffered in the war. And NATO, as an alliance, bridged that great ocean and created a force for stability, arising from time to time uh, to make certain that it asserted itself in the conversation. Now fast forward in the Cold War era to a different time, some 20 years ago. I can remember it because, as Gene and I were discussing at lunch, uh, as a young man, before I was elected to anything, I had a chance to uh, tour the Soviet Union. I went there for a three-week period of time in 1978. I was a guest of a program called, um, it's a little bit precocious, the American Council of Young Political Leaders. And uh, so they ended up inviting me, and I went and saw the Soviet Union firsthand. In the course of that visit, visited my mother's homeland, where she was born, in Lithuania, and saw Lithuania under Soviet rule. Uh, it was an important visit for me, for my family, and created images in my mind, which I still carry to this day, of what life was like. I used to go out in the downtown area of Chicago in February. We had something called Captive Nations Day. And we talked about what would ever happen to countries like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, other countries that had been absorbed after World War II by the Soviet Union. Would they ever have their independence and freedom again? I didn't think I'd live long enough to see it happen. But of course, some 21, 22 years ago, it did. And we saw with changes in the Soviet Union and eventually the collapse of the Soviet Union, the emergence of these countries, some from the Eastern Bloc, some former Soviet republics. I would like to explain to those critics of the militarism of NATO who are marching that were it not for the alliance, the NATO alliance, many of these countries may not be independent still today. I can remember when the Polish people presented me with a sword, because I was one of the senators who promoted the notion of Poland entering into NATO. I gave that sword to the Polish National Museum, and you can see it on Kazimierz Pulaski Day in Chicago if you're around. But the point is, they felt that that was the critical moment when they were going to be guaranteed their freedom and their security for generations to come. And the same thing true for the Baltic countries. NATO, in my mind, 
has been a guarantor of stability, an opportunity for freedom, which might not have existed otherwise. Jim Jones, has he spoken here yet? Tomorrow? General Jim Jones uh, uh, was formerly uh, the Supreme uh, Commandant of NATO, former the he formerly the head of the U.S. Marine Corps, and incidentally one of my classmates when I went to Georgetown School of Foreign Service a long, long time ago. And he envisioned NATO moving into areas of the world where there might be the need for some intervention. He thought about Africa as a continent. Some of you have studied, read, or maybe remember the Rwanda experience, what happened there when 800,000 innocent people died and no one would lift a finger. At the time, I was not in the Senate, but Paul Simon, my predecessor, was making phone call after phone call, trying to find some group that would come in and end the genocide that was happening in that country. Well, Jim Jones envisioned NATO looking for selective but important roles that it could play in bringing stability to parts of the world. And also, we know the Libya experience. I don't have to recount it here, where Muammar Gaddafi's dictatorial rule came to an end because of NATO. To my mind, NATO continues to play a critically important role. It is still the strongest alliance in the world. It is still an alliance with values that the United States can honor and respect and defend. And that's why I think this NATO summit uh, is an important gathering. And this is an important place for it. I, don't, I happen to be biased in this because I represent them in the Senate. I think this is one of the preeminent American cities because of its diversity. Most of the people, delegates from countries overseas who come to this NATO summit in a short cab ride can visit a neighborhood or a restaurant where people from their homeland live in Chicago. A nation of immigrants focuses on this city and many others too as really emblematic of the fact that in our diversity is our strength as a nation. And I'm glad that the folks from various countries can come and see this great city for many of them for the first time. So let me stop at this point, turn it over to my colleague. Thank you very much. I would like to welcome all of you to Senator Durbin's city, home city of Chicago. Um, I'm actually from the state of New Hampshire, which many of you who are not from the United States will know is the first state in selecting the president in our whole presidential selection process. So I'm delighted to be here in Chicago as well and enjoy the city's diversity and beauty. Um, you know, like Senator Durbin, I grew up in post-World War II America where NATO was viewed as one of the institutions that was going to help protect the Western world from the Soviet threat. Um, it was viewed as one of the institutions that was going to help protect us as we were looking at the standoff around nuclear weapons. And there was, at that time, in the 50s, a real, um, much more of a unanimity in this country about where people got their news and how the world view than we have today. And as we look today at where we are in terms of the world events and world institutions, NATO continues to be one of the institutions that is most influential, not only in terms of uh, the rela transatlantic relationship between the United States, Canada, and Europe, but also in terms of the rest of the world as we look at the mission in Afghanistan as we look at the threats around the world, whether it's from um, continuing threat of nuclear weapons, the threat from terrorism, the threat from cyber attacks, um, it is still the institution that can help address those threats around the world. And in the lead up to this summit, there's been a lot of discussion in the United States media questions raised about is NATO still relevant? Does it still make a difference? Is, um, do we still have a, an important relationship with Europe? And I think all you have to do is look at what's happening here in Chicago um, this weekend to answer that question with a resounding yes. Look at the number of countries that are represented here. 
Look, I don't know how many countries you all represent here. You know, Josh? Uh, I do not. Anybody, <laughs> anybody here know how many countries are represented in the audience? 35? Okay, so clearly more countries than who are part NATO members. Um, but we're all here because we understand that this continues to be um, the most important military alliance in my lifetime, in the last century, and continues to have relevance for what's happening in the world. And I think as we've seen um, recent events of even the last 10 years, the world is, has gotten closer, not further apart. Um, what happens in Afghanistan affects us here in the United States. And it's important for us to have the ability to work cooperatively to address those threats to our mutual security. And that's one of the things that NATO can do. But I would say to all of you, um, because there aren't very many people in this audience right now who were, grew up in the same generation that Senator Durbin and I did. Um, and one of the challenges I think we have is to continue to point out the important role that NATO has to play and its importance in allowing us to um, work cooperatively together in addressing some of the fiscal challenges that we face because as we look at budget challenges in Europe and the United States and other parts of the world, if we work together and share um, and cooperate on resources, then we're gonna be stronger. So I would hope that you all would leave this uh, weekend feeling like you're ready to carry the message about the important role that NATO continues to play and its relevance, not just for the member countries, but for all of those countries who are going to be affected by its reach. Thank you. All right. So we're going to uh, now move into the question and answer period. And I think by this point, everyone kind of understands the standard ground rules of keeping things short and to the point and making sure they're actual questions and not statements. Um, I'm going to abuse my moderator's privilege of, of asking the first question uh, about a different foreign policy challenge that's facing the Senate right now. Uh, from what we understand very soon, Senator Kerry, who chairs the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, is going to be opening hearings on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is something that's had this tumultuous history with the United States. Uh, 161 other countries have ratified it. There's been various forms of protest and opposition to it. And this year, that's coming up before the Foreign Relations Committee, and, and that's going to be somehow on the agenda. Uh, and I was wondering if the two of you could briefly at least share what, what your uh, perceptions are of the treaty and of the role that the United States could play in creating some sort of common legal framework for uh, sea use. Perhaps Senator Durbin, if you'd like to go first. Senator Kerry is anxious to bring this up for several reasons. Uh, being from Massachusetts, he is, of course, from a state uh, on a coastal situation, and he appreciates it uh, in terms of its impact that it would have on the United States and the world. Secondly, it is one of the highest priorities of Senator Richard Lugar, who, sadly, I will say from my point of view, was defeated two weeks ago in the Indiana primary. And I think uh, that Senator Kerry was waiting until that primary was finished to give uh, the Foreign Relations Committee an opportunity to bring up this issue. He's spoken to the leadership about the timing of this treaty and when it can be brought forward, and I hope that he gets his chance. I do support it. I think it is a good idea. I might also add that I am pushing for another treaty, a disability treaty, which uh, has been also ratified by many countries around the world, uh, and I don't think that the Senate is overburdened with work and couldn't consider two in one year, though it might be precedent setting. Uh, but first, we will probably move to the Law of the Sea Treaty and hearings, as you mentioned, very quickly. Yes. Let me just point out that we have a tradition in the Senate that the longer you've been in the Senate, the more seniority you have. Um, you generally go first. That's why Senator Durbin is always going to go first this afternoon. <laughs> um, I haven't been in the Senate as long as he has. As he said, I also support the Law of the Sea Treaty, and this is something that I think is long overdue. Um, it should have been ratified a long time ago. It has support from our military um, 
leaders. It has support, <coughs> excuse me, in the business community. And I think it's unfortunate that we haven't yet taken action on it. Um, and it reflects some of the challenges internally that we have in Congress in terms of dealing with um, treaties and also with anything that has um, any opposition at all in, among constituencies. Okay, so I think we'll just go all the way across. So, Benedetta. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Benedetta Berti, and I'm a young Atlanticist from Italy. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, the future of NATO's out of area operations. You, you talked a little bit about it, and I'm curious as to what are your thoughts about is there a future? What is the future given the growing, let's say, fatigue? both in Europe and in the United States and the financial crisis in both sides of the Atlantic. And if that's the case, if there's a future, are we looking toward an increasingly more flexible NATO, one where uh, in the context of uh, out of area operation we see more NATO acting with the backing of the UNSC, but through a, for the lack of a better term, a NATO coalition of the willing. Um, and just because you mentioned Libya and how NATO intervened in Libya to overthrow a dictatorship, I just would like to ask what about Syria? Thank you. Um, I, I think we will see continued out of theater operations based on what the threat is and what the situation is. Um, and, you know, one of the things that um, is in NATO's future and has worked very well in recent issues that have come before us has been the partnership agreements that it has as in the Libyan conflict, for example. Um, there were um, various Arab organizations who thought it was important and weighed in in support of taking action in Libya. So I do think that will help determine um, future actions when there are um, partnership countries who have something at stake, the ability to make the case to NATO to address whatever the issue is. I, I think we have not seen um, NATO action in Syria because we don't have some of that. We haven't seen some of the surrounding Arab countries who, have, who are pushing for that kind of action. Um, and there are a number of other, um, it's a very different military situation in Syria than it was in Libya. Having said that, I think we all um, decry the violence there, the civilian casualties. It's absolutely horrible, tragic what's happened there and what's ongoing. If I could just add one note about Syria. Uh, Three of us in the Senate uh, had a meeting with the uh, Russian ambassador in my office this last week. And uh, because of the close historic relationship between Russia and Syria, uh, have encouraged uh, Moscow to play uh, a role in bringing together uh, the variety of opposition groups together with Assad in an, in an effort to uh, try to broker some sort of at least ceasefire that lasts and perhaps beyond that, some vision of how to emerge from this violent scene. It would be so healthy and encouraging if that occurred, if they could show that kind of leadership in Moscow moving us forward toward peace. And they may be in a better position than some to do it. Gergely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Gergely Varga, uh, Young Atlanticist from Hungary. Um, there's gr growing concern and even frustration in the US Congress on European allies not uh, taking the fair, fair uh, share of the burden when it comes to defense. Will the US Congress uh, continue funding for the European phased missile defense system if uh, Europeans won't deliver as much as uh, some uh, members of Congress would like to do? Thank you. Well, let me just uh, tell you that uh, we are consumed, as most nations are, in the NATO alliance with the state of our economy, the number one issue among Americans uh, is the economy and jobs. And we are faced with uh, overwhelming, perhaps not as much as some European countries, but overwhelming challenges when it comes to the deficit. 
I was telling uh, Gene earlier that a recent analysis of our deficit produced the following. When we look back to the last time that America's federal budget was in balance under President William Jefferson Clinton some 12 years ago, and then chart how we have spent our money since to reach the current deficit situation, here's what we find in constant dollars. The money spent on domestic discretionary spending, education, health care programs, building highways, that sort of thing, flat. No increase since we were last in balance. The money spent on entitlement programs, uh, Medicare programs, veterans programs, and the like, up 30% reflecting a growing, aging population. Money spent on the military in the United States in the last 12 years has gone up 60%. So any fair analysis of bringing the budget into balance puts on the table everything, including military spending. That's why we are turning to our allies in NATO and saying uh, the United States is putting in about twice as much percentage GDP as most NATO nations are or are asked to contribute, 2 percent. We put in about 4 percent. And what we are hoping is that we could have better help from them to lessen the impact on the United States as we face these deficit issues. Does it mean at some point we will just turn and walk away? I don't think so. I think there will be other ways to approach it. And as uh, Mr. Rasmussen said to us in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we have to find ways to be more effective at lower cost. And there are ways to do this. Pooling uh, assets and resources, sharing technology within the NATO alliance to reduce the overall cost. OK, Timothy. Yes, Timothy Stafford from the United Kingdom. You both spoke about NATO issues, but looking at transatlantic issues more generally, I'd like to ask about the Eurozone debt crisis. And in particular, what consideration has your committee given to a partial or full breakup of the Euro? Um, I chair the European Affairs Subcommittee within the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And we had a hearing oh, last fall, so a long time ago, relative to events that have happened since then. Um, but one of the things that struck me from that hearing was the discussion around how interconnected our economies are, which we've seen um, here in um, the U.S. We had the worst week on the stock market um, than we've had in several years because um, most people attribute that to what's happening in Greece right now. And so there is definitely a correlation, and there's a great deal of concern. We're watching um, very closely. There's been an effort, I think, to um, support the Eurozone in every way we can. And one of the things that the experts said who were on the panel for the hearing that has struck, stood, stayed with me was that the most important thing we could do in the United States to help address what's happening in Europe is to address our own fiscal and debt crisis here. And so I'm hopeful that we actually are going to see some action in Congress to do that before the end of the year. Please. Hi, um, I'm Iris Ferguson, a uh, young Atlanticist from the US. Um, I worked on the Foreign Relations Committee from 2006 to 2008. Thank you guys for your leadership. Um, I remember at that time there was a lot of collegiality between the Biden and the Luger staffs, and we actually, I feel like, given some of the ideological differences, we got a lot done. With the recent ousting of Luger, how do you see the trajectory of the committee going? Um, and then a little bit back to the law, the C Treaty, because I remember when we were trying to pass it in 2008, I kind of feel like it might be the same tenor now. Yes, there's a lot of promise. Of course, there's a lot of um, potential for it to pass, given that it should have been a long time ago, and I know that you guys are for it. What are you doing to overcome the misperceptions that your constituencies have? Because we all know that that's really in the end, going to make it pass. I would just say that uh, the next Republican in line is Senator Corker, if I'm not mistaken, of Tennessee. And I think there is a friendly relationship between Senator Kerry and Senator Corker. And uh, we lose so much institutional memory and experience with Dick Luger. Let's be honest. I would not want to be compared or succeed him uh, in light of all that he's accomplished. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think my short term on the committee, I've just been there for a brief period of time, I think there's a potential for a cordial working relationship to develop. And meanwhile, Senator Luger has the remainder of the year where we're going to count on him. 
particularly when it comes to the law of the sea. I would hazard a guess that 99% of Americans couldn't even tell you what it does, why it's important. And I think that we need to take the time to explain it, why it is important in terms of, as Gene said, not just security, but commerce and our future relationship with many countries around the world. Uh, that's a positive thing for us to get done and I think that there will be some impetus behind it because of Senator Lugar's departure. And let me just add, um, there is an opportunity, even if we can't get it done between now and the election, in that lame duck session to address it. One of the things that um, those people who have watched Congress will remember from the last lame duck session is that there was talk um, for two years during the session that we were never going to get to the New START Treaty, and it wasn't until we got to the lame duck session that we were finally able to get that done. So I, I think we have not just from now until the election, but hopefully um, Senator Luger's gonna be there post-election and this would be a great um, legacy for him to leave. Please. Uh, hello, my name's Alex Dowson. I'm a student at Roosevelt University and I was a Shaheen for Senate uh, volunteer in 2008. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you two, the moderator spoke about um, the Senate having the power to declare war, and I think from where most in uh, political science, but also the media stand, that power seems to have been severely diminished in the past 10 years, and with the trajectory of uh, executive power in the president's office, the way that presidents tend to build upon the power of their predecessors, the new powers that their predecessors receive, but rarely give up power unless there's some sort of major Supreme Court change. Um, I'm wondering what you think the Senate's power to declare war means uh, in a time of these sorts of um, odd conflicts or things that might uh, be more on a presidential side or more on a NATO side, um, and whether the Senate could possibly need to reconfigure or, or come to terms with a new meaning of what it means to have that power in a world where wars uh, and what it means to declare war is in doubt. Well, I could give you a lecture that would go on for a long time because you've touched on a lot of issues. But between the time that uh, Franklin Roosevelt came to a joint session of Congress after Pearl Harbor with his Day of Infamy speech and there was an actual declaration of war for World War II uh, to the time uh, when uh, we resumed that tradition uh, spanned almost 40 years. In the meantime, there were dramatic major conflicts like Korea mm -hmm. and Vietnam that occurred. And it was Vietnam that really pushed the constitutional issue. Mm -hmm. The Constitution is explicit. Congress, the American people, through Congress, shall declare war mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, so that an executive couldn't plunge this country into war without taking the case to the people. And yet, members of Congress, in my experience, have looked at this with a jaded eye to first assert to the heavens their constitutional right to declare war and then run for the exits to avoid the responsibility mm -hmm. for fear that they will put us into a war that will be unpopular or we don't know enough about it. So War Powers Act was enacted by Congress after the Vietnam conflict that spelled out in statutory terms more explicitly the right of Congress and then passed over the veto of President Nixon. So it was an assertion that we're never going to go through another Vietnam. Congress is going to have its voice and its chance. Now fast forward, and to his credit, President George Herbert Walker Bush, as well as President George W. Bush, came to Congress for a declaration, uh, both in the Kuwait situation, as well as in Iraq and then Afghanistan. So you can't fault them for ignoring the Constitution. But now look at the nature of conflicts it is no longer a question, as it once was, of traditionally moving troops and planes and ships. We are now dealing with Libya, a humanitarian situation. Our colleague Jim Webb just last week introduced legislation kind of challenging us to take a look at this type of conflict where we are involved but not in a massive sense as we were in the past. What role will we play and how much time will we be given when literally lives are hanging in the balance? Let me give you one other wrinkle which I think you're gonna find is going to be increasingly popular in this discussion. What about wars involving cybersecurity? If the attack on the World Trade Center and the plane that went down in Pennsylvania 
and the loss of some 3,000 plus lives led us to declare war against Al Qaeda and to literally invade Afghanistan. What happens if there is a cybersecurity attack which claims even more lives and we are trying to trace its source and what response will follow? What is the role of the American people and Congress in making that decision? It gets much more difficult than it used to be. Good question, and I think our job is to try to sort through it. <clears throat> I think we have a constitutional responsibility even when it's painful to use it. Okay, I think we have time for probably uh, three more questions and we'll just take them all in a row and I guess shotgun them out. So if you can go and then we'll just carry the last two. Okay, thank you, uh, senators, for your time. I'm Nathan Dorn. I represent the state of Nebraska at the Young Atlanta CIS Summit. Um, my question is regards to, uh, Madam Senator, you talked about cooperating within NATO and cooperating with NATO. I was wondering how you can comment and share your thoughts on cooperating with NATO when oftentimes in Congress and in the United States Senate, we can't reach across the aisle and reach across party lines to cooperate with our fellow Republicans and Democrats. So I was wondering how can we talk about cooperation on an international scale when we can't even cooperate with our own countrymen? Well, I wish Congress would take a page from NATO. Um, I think it's one of the biggest challenges we face. And I can tell you what I have done personally. I've tried to um, work in a bipartisan way um, wherever I have the opportunity. But, you know, sadly, the reality, I, I think there are two issues. One is we have um, elected a small number of extremists who its goal is to obstruct things from happening um, because they don't believe in the role of government. And I think that's unfortunate because unless you're willing to compromise, you can't get anything done in a democracy. Um, and I think the other problem we have is frankly the Senate rules. I am new to the Senate. I was elected in 2008. Um, I was part of a group that um, worked to try and change those rules in uh, after the 2010 election, we wanted to change the filibuster rule, uh, not to get rid of it, but to require that if you're going to filibuster, um, for our friends from outside of the U.S., the filibuster rule allows you to, um, to object to a vote and it then requires 60 votes in the Senate in order to move forward rather than 51. Um, and what we wanted to do is to require anybody filibustering to go to the floor to of the Senate and actually talk about why you were filibustering so the public would understand that. We wanted to address some of the um, rules that allow one person to hold things up in the Senate and we weren't successful. But I think that needs to change because um, I think the Senate is a wonderful institution but some of the rules I think no longer work for the world that we live in today. Okay, I'm actually terribly sorry. I've just been told that we have uh, expended our time here. So I want to extend heartfelt thanks to Senator Durbin and Senator Shaheen. Uh, we are tremendously lucky to have had you here. So thank you very much for sharing your thank insights you all with very us. Much.